Hello, Umaru Kadagan, the Danish food doctor here. I think we need to somewhat change the way we speak of nutrition and of all the things that have a beneficial impact on health or a detrimental impact. Not that any of the things that are being said about calories or what foods are healthy, why they're healthy, how to eat, or why exercise is healthy for you, or sleep and getting enough of it is healthy for you, or why stress management is healthy for you, why not smoking is healthy for you. I mean, the way it's being said and the things are being said are perfectly correct, but they do not resonate with everyone. So based on my own clinical experience, and I've been working with health and nutrition and inspiring other people to be healthy or become healthy again for about 15 years now, I've dawned upon the fact that often we probably need not just to speak about all this logical objective information, which is highly relevant and very, very important, but we also need to find a way to speak to our mind, to our heart, to the soul, for the sole reason that what guides us is not pure logic. I mean, it's not due to a lack of knowledge about what constitutes a healthy lifestyle, you know, in terms of training, movement, sleep, nutrition. It's not that people lack the knowledge in general, but there's a long way from knowledge until that becomes action. And the reason being that we are more than just rational or logically thinking beings. And if you look at the story that's being told, or the way things are being communicated, we're looking at a lot of very factual approaches and also, maybe a lot of along the lines, I should say, if you suffer this much, or if you are this, sort of stay away from this stuff, or you're really, really good, then you earn the right to be naughty and eat something that's less healthy. I mean, and all the things are being said about calories in, calories right, out, they're correct. You know, we know that getting a nutritious diet is, diet is good for you, but again, What's the story? The story is something along the lines of, oh, do this or that will happen. And that usually being like, you'll become ill down the line. So in 25 years, 30 years, you'll more, you're more likely to get some sort of disease of civilization, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, some of the cancer types that are impacted by lifestyle. And therefore, you must not, you should not. Do not be naughty, do not misbehave or you will be punished. The problem, of course, is that's not necessarily the most motivating way of speaking. And again, we're back to this, all these things you mustn't do and all these things you must do. And that's a bit like a parent telling you, you mustn't do this and you must do that. And what usually happens, there's this small four-year-old inside most of us. And when parents come along and tell you what you must do, and usually have some, have some sort of very valid logical reason. There's a part inside you, the part of you that's at the same intellectual age as a two-year-old baboon that sort of, you know, wants to, you know, there's a certain finger, not very polite, wants to flick that and say, I don't think so. I'm going to do exactly the opposite of what you say. And that's probably also what happens at least some of the time when you're given this advice, you cheer these things and it's part of you saying, yeah, well, maybe, but then again, maybe not. I think I'm going to be naughty. And anyway, you know, this stuff, that what might happen down the line, I'll deal with that later. And then when I get older, when I'm in my 30s or in my 40s, then I'll start behaving. Or in my 50s, depending on your age, your chronological age limits. So yes, food is calories. Food, you can reduce it or speak about nutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, fiber, phytonutrients, um, you know, different types of fats, healthy, less healthy fats. You can speak about the amount of probiotics that might be in fermented foods, about things that are unhealthy, either in small amounts like trans fats or that can become unhealthy in too large amounts like added sugar and certain types of fats. But we're still back at all this sort of very reductionist approach, which I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying at least for communicative purposes or in terms of inspiration, might not be the best way to go about things. There might be other ways you can do this. And so you're back with this, oh, well, if you spend another 45 minutes on the Stairmaster or the Airdyne or the Concert 2 rower or the treadmill or you run some more, lift some more weights, 
then you've burned X number of calories. So now you've earned the right to sin and you can have another soft drink or some more cake or cookie or God knows what else, that sort of thing. And again, that's sort of correct when you think about nutrients in, nutrients out, or we're getting enough healthy nutrients compared to the unhealthy ones. But is it very inspiring? Is that really what makes you do things? For some people, yes. So depending on how you're, you know, what type of person you are, what motivates you, that might work. But there might just be people who also say, yeah, well, <laughs> nah, 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 I can't hear what you're saying. La, 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 bye, bye. I'm going to go do the exact opposite. Or maybe I'll do it later when I'm really, really ill. If, if I start getting in trouble, then I listen to that stuff. So how do we change the story being told about what food and healthy nutrition does to your body and also what exercise does for you? Well, maybe we should start looking at food and also some of the other things you do like exercise or unhealthy things like smoking as information. So imagine this, whatever you eat and drink or whatever goes in your mouth and whatever else you do to your body is a dialogue. It's a two-way dialogue. So you do something, you say something, and depending on what you say and depending on how you say it, you're going to get an answer back. And incidentally, the answer is very much affected by what you say and how you say it. And to make things very simple, when you have a dialogue or you communicate with someone, you can either be extremely friendly or extremely offensive and aggressive. So you can either be like, hey, fantastic, so good to see you. We're going to have a lovely time. And, you know, I love you. Maybe, okay, if you're, if you're not that close to them, don't say I love you. Just Make sure they know that you like them, you enjoy their company. Make sure you have their back, you know, hey man, I love being with you, I love, enjoy your company. I'm going to help you out. If you're in trouble, I'll have your back and I will support you, I'll believe in you. And once in a while I might provoke you a bit or just challenge you a bit, but only because I'd like you to excel or move along and progress, right? So that's like very positive communication and you're saying, I would like this and I enjoy you and you sort of get your, you affirm that you like people and you boost their ego a bit and you meet them with open arms and you're smiling like you're so going upwards. You could also communicate in a slightly different way and pardon the, the rude language and rude gest gestures here. Sorry, I'm Scandinavian, so um, we're a bit free spirited and free minded, but you could also do something along those lines up yours. I won't other anymore you know, terms or language that, so, sorry, that sort of fits that sort of gesture. And in that case, you're probably going to have a very different type of conversation, right? In the first scenario, hey, fantastic, lovely to see you. I imagine you're going to have a conversation along the lines of, hey, yeah, cool, we're going to have a great day, great hour, great evening, great week, great relationship. It's going to be great working with you having you as my student, my teacher, or being a student along with you, or a co-worker, or being in some sort of relationship with you, whether that's business or friendship or love and that sort of thing. Whereas if you're met, and I still won't other words that fit that sort of gesture, but if someone speaks, you to, speaks to you along those lines and communicates in that way, I don't really think you're going to be that friendly and forthcoming or cooperative. You're more likely going to answer them back in the same way, or you're just going to say, I'm not going to have any of that. So you can speak not to the hand, but to the back. Actually, I'm just going to leave. Or you start, you know, doing the same gesture, saying the same kind of language, or you hit them, or you go and, I don't know, pee in their wellies, you know, like their gum boots if they're out in the rain, or smack them, or you lie down and scream, or you get really sad and angry, or a combination of all of the above the previous things I just mentioned. And in that case, there's not going to be that much cooperation. It's going to be rather hostile and aggressive, henceforth. And you could think of food and nutrition the same way. So in other words, when you eat something, think about overall, not just saying we should look at the molecular constituents, we should also look at flavor, we should look at the company we're in. Do you enjoy eating that food? How does that feel? And then think of whether that overall is a message of love or at least, you know, friendly, a friendly approach or it's kind of uh, up yours or other rude language. In which case, then 
there's going to be a different response. And then think of your body, right? Now, your body can do all sorts of things. You might, you know, and I know this is scientifically, it's not exactly correct because it's not that your body can think, but imagine it this way, right? So your body says, hey, whoa, what's that in the bloodstream? LDL cholesterol particles, pretty interesting stuff. What should we do with those LDL cholesterol particles? Oh, well, there's sunshine striking my skin. Hmm, we could deliver some of that cholesterol in those LDL particles to my skin and allow the production of vitamin D to ensue. Or, whoa, hey, oh, hey, that's, yeah, male dude. Hmm, we could send some of those LDL particles down to the into his testicles and use the cholesterol as a building block for testosterone. Or, well, if it's a woman, it's not going to be here, but imagine there's a lovely woman standing in the frame in the picture with me. Whoa, that's a woman. We could take those LDL particles and send, her in, send, send it into her ovaries and maybe that cholesterol would be used for making progesterone, estrogen, female sex hormones that are important and beneficial. Or hey, we could send those LDL particles into the adrenals and we could make some cortisol and some aldosterone and some DHEA, steroid hormones that are really important for the stress response, for regulating your blood pressure, your fluid balance, and your salt balance, your you know, sodium levels. But we could also uh, play around with a bit of atherosclerosis. Maybe we'll take some of those LDL particles and we will see what happens if we deposit them in the arteries and then we sort of let them oxidize and white blood cells, macrophages come along and they see dead LDL particles scorched and they try to eat them and then they die in the process. So you get foam cells and get this mixture, mixture of activated, possibly dead white blood cells and sort of molten cholesterol particles and rancid scorched cholesterol particles, in which case we're going to have some atherosclerosis because we're going to like have some calcification to try to block off all this dead rancid stuff to prevent it from doing damage, which with time will make your arteries more stiff and then will narrow your arteries and when things get really bad, either they narrow to the point that you do not have proper blood flow or some of that calcification on top of these deposited LDL particles kind of rips off and then you get dead tissue mixed with rancid fats tumbling into your bloodstreams or into your bloodstream which will immediately activate clotting boom, and then you get a blood clot and that might give you a heart attack or stroke right so you're worried about but how do i choose should i try to direct things towards uh, some of the beneficial things we can do with ldl particles or should we play for atherosclerosis i'm not really sure hey Cool, lovely to see you. Okay, this is really strange because when I wave at you, I have like 10 fingers, two hands, and I'm smiling, and you're doing something quite different. You're looking pretty hostile, and that's not, you're not way, oh, okay, that's the sort of message you're sending. That's the, so you, that's the way you want to play. You know what? LDL particles and vitamin D, I don't think so. Testosterone, nah. Estrogen, progesterone, not so much. Cortisol, maybe DHEA, I'm not sure. Aldosterone, either none or way too much. Atherosclerosis, oh yeah, two can play that game. Right? As far as you know, it's not like your body sits there and decides, but if you look, use that picture, if you use that imagery, if you use that metaphor, it makes it a lot more vivid to you and maybe easier to understand. Or imagine like, even 500 more calories than you burn. Now, I know this is purely hypothetical, but play along. Where would your body place those 500 excess calories? Now, hmm, could maybe, you know, use them for making guns or buns or quads. If you strength train, right? Oh yeah, by the way, strength training input again to your body to tell it to become stronger. Or we could also say, hmm, you know what? I think I'm going to take those 500 extra calories and I'm going to deposit them right here on your midsection. So we're gonna make sure your, your midsection is padded to the extent that a walrus would feel like a very, very skinny scout, boy or girl scout, right? And again, so what do we do? Oh, 500 calories in excess. I'm not really sure where we should place those, should we? Go for making guns, buns, quads, other funny stuff, or midsection padding. Hmm. 
I don't know. Maybe we can flip a coin. I'm not sure today. You know what? I'm still doing this. You're doing that. I don't really think that we're going to give you guns, buns, and quads. I think we're going to play around with your midsection. Make it really pudgy. And apart from what it might do to your appearance, if that is something you're concerned about, there, there are probably going to be some metabolic consequences down the road. Two can play that game. If you're going to be nasty to me, I'm going to be nasty to you. Or, right? Your body says, hmm. So there's, you know, we can trigger inflammation. Should we do that when appropriate? So like, you have a sore throat, you have bacteria, streptococci possibly, and we unleash the inflammatory response, trigger the immune system to move in and kill those unwanted visitors. Or we could unleash inflammation, say, upon your elbow or your shoulder, your knee or your Achilles tendon, just make sure that you're in pain all the time and that those tissues degenerate for no use, no good whatsoever. I'm not really sure what to choose. How should we use inflammation? Hey, good to... Whoa, hey, you're, you're doing the same thing. You're smiling, you're waving. You know what? As your body, I'm going to endeavor I'm going to try to do my very best only to sort of trigger aggressive inflammation when there's an infection or serious injury that needs to be healed and all that chronic, low-grade, unspecific inflammation or perpetual inflammation in your musculoskeletal system that serves no purpose but might just lead to pain or dysfunction or damage. I'm going to do my very best to limit that. But you chose to be kind to me, so I'll try to be kind to you. So I think... You know, thinking of food as information is another way of approaching or think, trying to figure out what's healthy, what's not. And I'm not saying every single food, every single mouthful you eat or what you drink has to be something we're thinking. Oh, if this were a message, it's only pure love on all levels in terms of calories in, calories out, metabolism, nutrient composition, phytochemicals, omega-3 fatty acids, healthy protein, blah, 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 blah. That's not the point, but overall... And it's probably not going to require a PhD in nutrition or biochemistry or human physiology to figure out that like a meal with lots of vegetables that have been cooked and prepared, not necessarily cooked, but might have been sliced and dashed, but prepared in a way with, and with, you know, with flavors, with spices that give you lots of flavor and where you haven't destroyed the nutrients. You get some healthy protein source, fish, poultry, maybe some beef or lamb, shellfish or some vegetable protein like legumes, you know, chickpeas, lentils, beans. You might get a bit of wine and you have some dark chocolate, that sort of thing. Overall, if that's what you eat most of the time, if you do not overdo the, the wine, just have a small glass every day or every second day or once in a while, that's going to be that, so that sort of message of love. And that's what's going to make your body comply or let's not speak in this negative language where you force your body to do something but it's going to much increase the likelihood that your body is going to be your partner cooperate with you rather than try to show its very worst and unleash the whole arsenal of dysfunction pain and inflammation and all these other things that with time can lead to disease and symptoms and the decrease of quality of life, less vitality, less energy, and aging in the most unfortunate way, right? So maybe that's the way we should start thinking about food. Basically think of what you eat, what sort of information are you getting? And the same thing goes for exercise. Exercise is not just about burning calories or getting bigger guns or better pecs or better buns or quads, although those are all, if you're strength training, nice side effects from training or Becoming a faster, a better athlete, better endurance, faster, I can beat the others. When they're on the pavement gasping for air, I'm still going, you know, although oh, well, that's all very nice if you're competitive. But really what you're doing when you exercise is you're telling your body, sometimes with a kind of tough love, to be in its best behavior and cooperate. And that's, of course, as long as you don't overtrain and make sure you do exercise appropriate to your starting point. That's it, that's it. And if we're really going to sort of make it very vivid with this imagery, with these metaphors, then think of it this way, right? 
your mouth, back to inflammation, is one of the most sensitive uh, parts in the human body. I think there are about somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000 highly sensitive nerve endings in your mouth. Right? I mean, there are a few other places with even more highly sensitive nerve endings that are usually brought into play during uh, adult activities. But your mouth tends to be used a lot more and it senses a lot more. So my question to you is going to be, do you kiss just anyone? Probably not. Well, okay. If you're male and you're a um, teenager or tween and you're less than 25, maybe I shouldn't ask you this question because the answer might very likely be, oh yeah, anything that happens to be the sex I'm interested in with two legs or four legs, I'm on if they want to kiss. But you know, once your frontal lobes fully develop, you're usually a bit selective in terms of what person, or what experiences you want this very delicate sensory apparatus to actually feel and sense and experience. If that's the case, well, and alcohol, of course, might disrupt this uh, selective ability, but provided there's nothing going on to disrupt your mental and cognitive function, you're going to be a bit selective, say, I'm not going to kiss just anyone, right? No, I'm, not, I'm just actually going to go for the best of the best. Well, if that's the case, then should you eat just anything? Because when you eat something, it actually goes in your mouth. So what you eat is kind of like thinking, hmm, you're kissing a person. And sorry to be very graphic again, very vivid with the imagery, but we're not talking a peck on the cheek here. We're like talking full on snogging, tonsil hockey. If you're going to play tonsil hockey with someone, I suppose you'd really want it to be something, someone you find extremely hot, not just in the moment, but next day as well and a week later. Someone you'd love to spend time with and someone that's good for you, not just, whoa, <gasps> this person was absolutely hot, sexy, stunning. But when you wake up next day, you're like, oh, oops, phew. Can I get out of here? Or give me some alcohol so I can sort of erase the memory, right? That's not what you want. I want. I mean, th saying if you're going to do have to play tonsil hockey with someone, make sure it's the absolute damn best person for you. Or if you're very naughty, maybe it's a group of people. Again, I'm Scandinavian. We might be a bit more liberal than wherever you are, but think of it that way, right? So think of the same with food. So in fact, we could sort of say when you eat, you have the choice of who or what group of people you're about to snog full on. Now that could be, and again, choice is yours, the equivalent of say, Marilyn Monroe, Cindy Crawford, um, Elena Christensen, Marlene Dietrich, Greta Garbo, Beyonce, Tina Turner, or it could be Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, George Clooney, young James Dean, young Elvis, Clark Gable, could also be Jabba the Hutt, or we haven't really seen any female Hutts in the Star Wars movies, but Jabin the Huttess, if you can imagine her. And now I kind of imagine that probably not the sort of, if you're thinking about Jabba the Hutt or Jabina the Huttess, if she exists, those are probably not the living organisms you would want to sort of snog full on. Yeah. Don't do that to me. I would have to commit suicide afterwards or at least drink heavily or take drugs to get rid of the memory permanently or sort of make sure it doesn't appear in my consciousness. Well, in that case, think about what you eat and what you drink. And if you were to look at it as information or as a person, a being, an entity or a group of people or a group of beings you're about to snog full on with, are you getting more of this? Or more of either, again, sorry about waving my middle fingers, that or, oh, please don't save me. Because in some way you could say your body's going to respond in kind. So that's why I think we need to at least partially change the way we look at and speak about nutrition and health and what all these healthy things do to us. It's good with all the science, all the theoretical objective stuff, with all this sort of counting but we need to do more because as human beings, as intelligent as we are, might be or think we are, we're not just objective. There's a lot of more, a lot more going on, some sort of very primitive emotions that are 
also driving us. And those primitive emotions that drive us, some of these more primitive mechanisms, they tend to pertain or to respond to humor, laughter, imagery, either very vivid, and that could either be beautiful imagery or sort of pretty scary stuff. And that's at least my experience. I don't haven't done any clinical studies on it, but when I speak to nutrition and health this way and tell people it's not just about all the sort of scientific stuff or the measurement stuff or the logical stuff, but we're also looking at information and thinking about what you what sort of information you give yourself or you're given and how you'd respond. My experience is that a lot of people become a whole lot more motivated and it becomes easier for them to understand and they laugh. And laughter sometimes can help remove some of the barriers that get in the way of people making change, even if it's hard to make those changes or that single change. Anyway, those were just my two cents, five bits, two euros, ten Danish kroner, one and a half US dollars about why we should speak about nutrition and food and what we drink and also exercise, not just as numbers, science, something we measure or in a reductionist way, well that's completely correct and appropriate, but also think of it in another way, as I've just done. My name is Maro Kadakan. I'm also known as the Danish Food Doctor, and I hope that I've helped inspire you to do what's necessary to get all the health, all the vitality and all the well-being you wish for and deserve. Thank you for your time and attention.